Okay, so for Wednesday, uh, you uh, you have this uh, next homework to do, isn't it? Uh, and uh, the in that homework, you are supposed to implement uh, the LDA approximation, which is uh, beyond what we have done for the, with the hydrogen atom. So it has to have this uh, proper Poisson uh, solution of the Poisson equation and proper exchange correlation uh, potential added. Uh, to, and, and he has to solve the hydrogen atom for, uh, he has to solve the uh, DFT for uh, oxygen or something heavier, doesn't it? Um, now, today, uh, we are going to continue discussing uh, random numbers uh, and uh, high dimensional integration. Um, so, the first I want to uh, uh, repeat uh, what we learned last time, namely that if we integrate a certain arbitrary function uh, over uh, some volume, let me call it dx for now, we can use important sampling by, uh, uh, by sampling f over some weight function w, but then we need to make sure that the points x that appear is an argument in this function are distributed uh, with probability distribution equal to this weight function. Okay, so once more, we can divide uh, the function. No, actually, we can we can generate uh, the uh, the points x uh, with some uh, generic distribution w, but then we need to divide uh, function f with this w when we integrate. So relatively simple prescription. Now here w is an arbitrary positive definite function. Okay. Um, why? Because otherwise it cannot describe probabilities, isn't that? Because it needs to be, it, this is probability for a certain point to appear, uh, to appear uh, in, in our uh, sampling. So uh, we discussed last time of how to generate uh, a certain relatively simple uh, um, uh, uh, simple distributions such as Gaussian exponential functions. In this case, we can do uh, we can find these uh, distributions analytically. But for more uh, complex functions, we cannot do this analytically. We need to do it numerically. And uh, the important question is uh, how to how to do that. And one uh, prescription is by Vegas algorithm. Now, but before we discuss uh, Vegas algorithm, we should, we should, we would like to ask a question of what is the best choice for the weight function. So if you have an arbitrary complicated, um, a complicated uh, uh, function f, what should we take for, for w? Um, and the answer is very simple. Turns out that uh, the absolute value of f is of course always positive function, it's positive definite function, and turns out to be the best possible function, okay? So uh, we want to prove that because it's the proof is so simple that it actually makes sense to repeat it here. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is, uh, yeah, so first we are integrating uh, a a function over volume V. Uh, and as we discussed before, we uh, in, in this integral, we sample F over W, with certain weight w dv, as that that's the same integral, and then when we actually do this in Monte Carlo, this is the probability with which we uh, with which we uh, uh, visit certain points, uh, and then when when we sample, we actually sample this f over w, as that so we we are calculating average of f over w, uh, and then our error is uh, is given by this expression, which is the uh, standard deviation divided by n, uh, because the error of Monte Carlo goes as uh, uh, one over n square. Professor Holly. Yes. Uh, I have a question for previous session. Yes. So um, when it comes to like generating, like sampling according to the weights, so we need basically need to like get the inverse of the weight the distribution function. Absolutely. But why do we just uh, generate distribution of that, uh, generate sampling of that distribution? Like I know there are some like uh, metropolis methods, like we can generate 
samples according to the distribution function. So is there any like drawbacks for that method? Uh, we will discuss, of course, uh, how to use Metropolis in this case. But the problem is that uh, it's if the function is not simple function like uh, product functions that we are going to discuss in uh, in this chapter in Vegas, then you don't know how to even integrate such a function, uh, even less how to uh, how to find uh, points that are distributed according to their distribution. Uh -huh. you, can't, you can't do it. I mean, you, you don't know the function yet. So how are we gonna? Uh, we, we, you you can try to do it self consistently. Of course, uh, you sample for some time and you try to figure out what the, how the function looks like, doesn't it? And then you use that information in the next iteration to kind of generate uh, points with such distribution. But the even when you use Metropolis, you have to be able to integrate such a function or uh, analytically or numerically okay you have to be able to integrate it and the only way that you can integrate the function is that if you uh, kind of um, uh, use an ansatz we're going to use uh, separable ansatz for vegas okay so we're going to say let's say that the function is approximately separable and then i can integrate it then it's easy or in in, in metropolis we're going to use uh, separable plus convolutions, arbitrary convolutions. Convolutions we can also integrate. But if you have a generic function that, that you don't know how it depends on, on, on its arguments, you cannot integrate it. I see. And okay. You can generate points according to the distribution. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if we could, then of course that, that wouldn't be a problem. Then, then we wouldn't discuss this. <laughs> We're too simple. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, the uh, what we try to figure out here is what is the best possible weight function uh, with which we wanna uh, we wanna uh, we wanna use to sample function uh, integral for function f, and uh, what we what we wanna do is we wanna minimize this. Uh, uh, this uh, sigma square, okay, variance, okay, we want to minimize this function. So th th what does it mean? It means that we want to find minimum of that. So what is that? Well, I just copied this thing here and wrote it, repeat it. So f over w square minus h f square, but now we need to minimize this with a constraint that w is normalized, doesn't it? So uh, in order to find minimum uh, of the function with the constraint, we need to add this uh, so-called Lagrange multiplier, isn't that this is Lagrange multiplier that makes uh, this constraint satisfied, okay? So um, now can we now worry this? The question, we need to find minimum uh, of, of this uh, functional. So you can think of it as a functional and we need to find minimum of this functional. Uh, now um, we, of course, by, by worrying worrying analytically, we're going to get extremum. But uh, with proper uh, physical interpretation, we could uh, we know that this extremum is also minimum, or we could ca calculate the second derivative, and we could see that uh, that uh, second derivative is positive. So we think that, that this particular uh, particular uh, extremum is actually a minimum. So we want to worry this. So how do we do it? Well, um, first we rewrite this average in terms of uh, in terms of an integral. So basically, this average here is you see f over w square is repeated here, and then when we average means actually integration uh, with respect to the weight function w dv. Okay, so now this term has to be can be analytically rewritten as f over w w dv, but then the entire integral has to be has to be squared. Doesn't it? Okay, and then finally I can I can copy this constraint, and now I I realize that this w w here cancel. Okay, so therefore this part here is just is just a constant. Okay, so when when I worry such a thing when I when I take the uh, variation uh, of a constant is zero. I can I can uh, remove this term. 
So here I have uh, W and W cancel. So we have, I have F square divided by W only, not W square. Uh, and then here I have W uh, in uh, first power, linear power. And now of course, yeah, and this is, this is what I wrote here. So uh, when I cancel this properly, that's what I get. Uh, and now I need to worry this function. Well, but that's easy, isn't that? So I'm worrying this with respect to W. So the question is, what is the best W? And when I worry uh, one over W with respect to W, I get uh, uh, the derivative of one over W is of course, minus one over W square, isn't it? The usual mark, usual derivative. So therefore I get here F square divided by W square with a minus sign. And here I get plus lambda because we're, uh, I'm worrying with respect to W. So basically this is what I get. Actually here, if I'm, if I'm careful, I get DW uh, as a product, but this I can, I can cancel out. So this is our result. Um, when F squared divided by W squared minus lambda integrating, integrated over the entire volume is equal to zero, that means that uh, we achieve uh, extremum. Um, now, if lambda is positive function, uh, actually it has to be positive function, but so therefore it means that F average uh, or absolute value of F divided by W has to be constant, which of course means that the two W and the absolute value of F have to be proportional. And that's, that's all I wanted, we wanted to prove. So uh, once more, the best, the extremum is achieved when the w itself is proportional to the absolute value of the function f, because we need a positive definite uh, function. Okay, now, um, if we know a good approximation for function f, we can use this information to sample the same function f to higher accuracy with important sampling. So that's what they're gonna do. The solution can thus be improved iteratively. This idea is implemented in Vegas algorithm, uh, we will also, if we have time, we will also discuss the same type of algorithm, but with, uh, with um, uh, what is it, uh, Markov chain. So we can actually implement similar idea using Markov's chain. And I think it's slightly more efficient. Of course, it depends on the integral, but uh, one, can, one can get uh, similar precision, let's say with Markov's chain, but I think that the algorithm itself is slightly more complicated. Okay, so um, there is another set of algorithms which uh, is good to touch upon. I mean, we're not gonna implement them, but at least we are gonna uh, 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 give the idea. So the idea is to divide the volume into smaller subregions and check in each subregion how rapidly is the function f worrying in each subregion. So the, quanti uh, the quantitative estimation can be the variance of the function. So in other words, we throw in a small uh, uh, part of the cube uh, points and we estimate the variance in a small part of the cube. So we have, you, you can think of it as a, having a big cube here, which is divided into many uh, sub cubes like this. And then uh, we check in each sub region, we check what is the variance uh, in that sub region. And if it turns out that the variance is big, that means that function has a peak in the sub region and then we need to put, we need to throw more points into that subregion, doesn't it? So that's one, one, one possible idea. So the idea is to increase the number of points in those subregions where the variance is big. So this algorithm is called stratified sampling and is used in MISR uh, in a uh, routine or MISR integration routine. So if you see some more implementation of MISR, you know that this has to do with a stratified sampling. The idea is simple and powerful, but it's not very useful for high dimensional integration. So it's useful when you have integration of the order of 10, dim 10 dimensional, maybe 20, 50. I mean, there are lots of problems that need uh, 30 dimensional integration or 50 dimensional integration. And in this case, stratified sampling is actually very, very good. But when you go to very high dimensions, uh, this uh, stratified sampling actually fails or it's not very efficient. And the reason for this is very simple. It's because the number of subregions grows exponentially with the number of dimensions. So therefore, uh, this is uh, this idea. Um, so this, this can work only if you have some idea of how to construct small subregions. So if you naively 
take a cube and just divide uniformly the cube into smaller subregions, we have exactly the same problem that we had in, uh, let's say, trapezoid rule or any other um, uh, quadrature. Because the, the, the reason that we can't use quadrature is because it's just too expensive to uh, subdivide the space into uh, into exponential number of uh, of small uh, small subregions. So um, is, so, but of course, if we have some idea of how to construct small number of subregions, then we can still use this. You know, small number of sub subregions. So this trick is useful. Is used also in in, in a Vegas algorithm. Uh, in uh, when it's combined with uh, with Misser uh, algorithm. So, for example, implementation in uh, GNU scientific library uses a combination of Vegas and Misser uh, together. Um, our implementation is actually going to be uh, a pure Vegas. Not uh, we're not going to add stratified sampling, but in principle we could if we if we wanted to. Okay, so. Um, this was the introduction uh, into this high dimensional integration. Now we are going to uh, concentrate on one particular algorithm, which I think it's useful to uh, to know, uh, which is Vegas. Um, so the original uh, uh, the original uh, publication was appeared in 1978 by Peter Lepeg, um, and uh, here is the sketch of the algorithm. Uh, and uh, implementation is uh, available on GitHub, or you can download it from the download it from our web page. Uh, the um, the current implementation that I uh, give you is in Jupyter Notebook, uh, but you can also find on the web page the uh, kind of imp uh, implement C++ implementation that uses uh, GNU Scientific Library. Of course, this uh, the later implementation is is uh, several orders of magnitude faster, because it turns out that uh, uh, Monte Carlo uh, uh, need, needs um, Monte Carlo is not so good in Python. It really needs uh, in compiler, uh, but still to learn algorithms, Python is more convenient than uh, than writing the C plus plus algorithms. Okay, so um, now. Uh, is there any question up to up to now? Any question? No. Okay. Then let me continue uh, sketching the algorithm. Uh, so the Vegas is primarily based on important sampling with the above mentioned self-adapting strategy. So the basic idea is to use separable weight functions. Does the instead of the complicated W, we use we use the ansatz that function is separable uh, along the axis, x, y, z, and so on. So that's the basic, the basic point. So uh, everything else is basically just map, but this is, this is the important point. So uh, in, uh, in Markov chain, we're gonna be able to use slightly more, um, slightly more generic uh, ansatz, for example, instead of uh, v1 of x times v2 of x minus v3 of x, we're going to use v1 of x times v12 of x minus y, for example, and v2 of y, and then v, uh, let's say, 2, 3 of y minus z, okay? So this is, this, the, this, uh, this uh, extra uh, convolutions here are something that is actually very hard to use uh, within Vegas, but within, uh, uh, what is it, uh, um, Marco chain, we can use more gener generic functions. Now, again, the issue is that uh, if we don't know how the functions depend on the variables, uh, and generically we don't know for, 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 for generic function, then we cannot uh, integrate it, we cannot invert it, and we cannot um, uh, generate points according to this distribution. So we need to uh, have some idea uh, to numerically store the wave, fu the wave function. Um, now, the, for, for, our weight function is going to be not exactly proportional to uh, absolute value of f, but almost absolute value of f. So basically, what we use here 
is basically absolute value of f divided by w times the absolute value of f. So basically, it's it's kind of absolute value of f weighted by the w by by the uh, ratio between f and w, doesn't it? Uh, because uh, yeah, uh, so this is a little bit more convenient, or basically this is what's being used in Vegas algorithm. But um, uh, notice that when I'm calculating the weight function for x, we are I'm integrating out all other dimensions but x. So in some sense, this reminds you of uh, density matrix in quantum mechanics, isn't that? In density matrix in quantum mechanics you integrate out all the rest of degrees of freedom, but you keep one, uh, one, uh, uh, one degree of freedom or one X, one uh, dimension. Okay. So all others are integrated out. Okay, so um, the power of Vegas is that by iteration, it can resolve any divergency point, which is separable in parallel to any axis. However, when the divergence is along the diagonal, Vegas is similar to Monte Carlo, to naive Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo sampling. You cannot improve it actually. So uh, the if you have a if you have a two-dimensional problem, let's say, and your divergency is in few points, Vegas will be perfect. If the divergency is on along the axis, Vegas will do a great job. However, if the divergency turn, turn out to be exactly along the diagonal, then you are in trouble. So Vegas will not be better than naive Monte Carlo throwing throwing all the points. Now, uh, if you, however, implement a weight function that uh, will not be just separable, but we will be of this form, v1 of x, v2 of y times v12 of x minus y, then uh, such an ansatz will, of course, take care of, uh, of the diagonals as well, doesn't it? So this will take care of all axes and diagonal. Okay. Now, of course, if it turns out that the that uh, uh, that uh, the divergence is somewhere completely else that uh, we have no clue where, then this would not help either. So, in computer graphics, for example, we, uh, you sometimes need to resolve uh, sharp edges. Uh, let's say that the, the, your 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 um, race tracing. Uh, something that has that is a, I don't know like an object with a very sharp table or a very sharp very sharp edge, then uh, uh, it appears in an arbitrary point and this is a hard problem um, and you uh, and Monte Carlo might uh, even a complicated ansatz might not be able to resolve it. So. Um, but in most physics problems, of course, we know something about our functions. So we can um, uh, change the variables in such a way that hopefully most of the divergences are going to be along some axis, or in such a way that uh, divergences are going to be along a uh, certain difference between arguments. So typically in physics, we have, uh, we have expressions that have to do uh, with R1 minus R2, isn't that? So this is very, very, or Ri minus Rj. Okay, so in general. So if we, uh, yeah, so function depends on something like that, isn't it? So if we know that the function is kind of on average, depends on the on the distance between two particles, then uh, definitely convolutions are a very uh, very good uh, uh, very good idea, uh, and of course much better than the um, than Vegas itself, which is just. Which is basically the way the way you should think of it is that we are, we are doing this f of r1 times f of r2 and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah, Vegas is similar to usual Monte Carlo sampling when the yeah when the divergence along diagonal. Um, note that separable ansatz avoid the explosion of the stratified regions. Which scale is k to the d? So as we discussed before, the stratified uh, uh, stratified uh, sampling would require k to the d uh, points, where d is the dimension, and k is the number of points in each dimension. So if we have k of the order of hundred, let's say we need hundred points in each dimension, and d is let's say ten, then uh, then hundred to the power of ten. Uh, 
is an enormous, uh, an enormous, uh, uh, huge um, uh, number and needs zeta bytes just to store the function. For example, let's say that we sample it for some time, we would need zeta bytes just, just to store the function. And then thinking about inverting such a function is just uh, impossible because you will not have enough um, uh, precision in each uh, small subregion. So uh, this strategy of uh, of doing k to the d when k when d is large and k is large is completely impossible. But uh, in um, in this uh, using this um, separable ansatz. We are actually translating k to the d into k times d, uh, because we are going to use only um, k points in each dimension, and then because we are writing this as, sep as, as uh, separable ansatz, we are going to need only times d uh, degrees of freedom. So this k times d is actually very small. So this will be ten to the power of three. It's a very small problem. Okay, so uh, what do we do in practice? So th th this algorithm is written. This um, algorithm is written in such a way that uh, is compatible with implementation and with the original paper by uh, by Peter Lepag. Uh, and I'm going to try to translate it here into our uh, language that we used in previous lecture. Okay, so that we kind of uh, make the parallel uh, between the two. So uh, we try to, well, we need to integrate uh, f of g1, g2, and g3, and so on. So g are, is the original variable. We call it g because g is going to be used as a grid. So this is a grid. Uh, and then we need to integrate over dg1, dg2, and so on. So here we are using uh, integral from 0 to 1 uh, for simplicity. Uh, uh, of course, we could be integrating here from a to b. Okay, and this uh, changing the integration from a to from zero to one to a to b is relatively straightforward. So all we need to do is to uh, properly rescale these random numbers. Isn't it? So we're going to use this at the end of the day just as a rescaling step. So instead of uh, getting random numbers with zero from zero to one, you shift the uh, the lower bound to a and you shift the upper bound to b and you stretch the whole thing with uh, with the size of the interval, which is b minus a. So that's relatively simple. Uh, so for simplicity, for now, all the integrals all, all the integrals go from zero to one. Okay. Then um, what we are going to do is we are going to change the variable. So basically, all this uh, all these uh, weight functions are basically just a change of variable. Uh, yeah, and I think that I have here a slight issue. So dx dy appears twice. It shouldn't because we have it, we have it here. So the x, dy, dz. Okay. So uh, we are changing the variable so that we are gonna use. So the g is actually a function now, g of x, g one of x, g two of y, g three of z, and so on. So when we change the integration like this, of course we need to use here Jacobian. Okay. So now this integral is of course exactly the same integral. We are just changing the variables. So now the G1 depends on only on X, G2 depends only on Y. So Jacobian is really simple to calculate for separable function, it's just the product of uh, the derivatives. Um, so we first start with the grid points, G I of X is X. So the integration in the first iteration is equivalent to usual Monte Carlo sampling the, with, because we don't have any information the, for the function yet. So we generate a few thousand set of random points and evaluate F on these points. During the sampling, we evaluate the integral. So this integral average of f is actually our desired integral. So this is what we are looking for. We are looking for the uh, for the value of the uh, average of f times the volume is actually our integral, isn't it? Uh, but volume right now is uh, in hypercube is just one. Um, so um, what we need to sample at the end of the day is this f of g1 of x, g2 of y, g3 of z, dg1 over dx, dg2 over dy, and dg3 over dz. Why? Because the distribution with respect to x, y, and z is going to be um, is going to be uniform. So 
uh, random, so know that the random points are uniform distributed on mesh X, on mesh Y, and so, uh, and so on. Therefore, the unit volume is equal to one. So now let me translate this into the uh, language of the previous um, of the previous um, uh, discussion. Uh, so if we so what is the weight function? So this quantity here is the inverse of the weight function. Why? Because as we said last time, uh, what we what we are what we are going to do is we are going to um, be evaluating f over w, average of f over w, in such a way that the probability for g is w of g, doesn't it? So this is what we uh, discussed last time, doesn't it? Uh, why? Because the, the why why this is g because this g's are actually the variables of f. Okay, so these are the variables that enter the function f. So this is what we need to do. We need to. Uh, sample f over w, average of f over w, in such a way that the probability for each g is equal to w of g. Now, uh, let's try to see how is this related to that. Well, these two uh, are one to one if we uh, identify that the weight function is actually dx or dg1, dy or dg2, dz or dg3, does that? Why? Because, well, this has to be uh, W inverse, doesn't it? Okay, so this is the weight function. But then it means that the probability for G has to, is, of course, probability is DP over DX to DX over DG. So this is G, DX over DG. It's not Y, it's DX over DG, okay? And similar probability, this is probability for G1 is probability is dp over dx to dx over dg1. And similarly, the probability for uh, dg2 is probability dp over dy times dy over dg2, and so on. So now you uh, now you see that, the, that uh, this distribution with respect to x, dp over dx is one, and dp over dy is one, because we, de we decided that distribution with respect to x is going to be uniform from zero to one and therefore the probability with respect to g is actually dx over dg but this is exactly weight function w so in other words uh, we are exactly implementing this so probability with respect to g is corresponding weight function for g isn't it and when we integrate we have to take f over w and uh, actually f divided by jacobian but uh but uh, jacobian is just uh is just the product of the uh of this derivatives okay so in other words this is this uh implementation is just one variant of this uh, implementing this function that we discussed last time change of variable in some sense okay so uh the of course the Vegas has lots of little uh, little tricks um, uh, and little details which we're gonna which we're gonna go through and discuss right now. Um, so a, in addition to the uh, to sampling the value of the function f, so this will uh, eventually give us the integral of the function. We are gonna sample also uh, projections of the function to uh, various dimensions. So here we uh, sum over y, z only, and we don't sum over x so that we get the uh, corresponding projection of the function uh, to x dimension. And similar here, we integrate, we sample over x and z only so that we get projection of the function to the second dimension and projection of the function to the third dimension. Now, um, these functions f1, f2, and three are exactly what we need as our weight for our weight functions because we said that weight function is going to be proportional to that. Uh, notice here that we said f, f average square divided by w, and this is exactly what uh, what this function is because um, uh, this basically is f square. Uh, well, f square is the same as absolute value of square, uh, and then this dg over dx is the same as w square but then 
uh, we uh, when we integrate, we actually do W times uh, yeah, we integrate this, isn't that times W, but uh, uh, times W D uh, DV, and of course one W can cancel, and basically this corresponds to F squared divided by W DV, and that's uh, that's what we said bef uh, before. So we are we are integrating. So the wave functions are going to be proportional to F divided by W uh, integral over the rest of the dimensions. Oops, yeah. So these are the proper projections that are going to be used later on to construct the grid. Okay. Now, uh, once we once we sample uh, those uh, functions and we construct F1, F2, F3, and so on, then we need to, from those functions, we need to somehow construct the grid. They're kind of, the grid is kind of proportional to, to, to those functions, but not exactly. So let me uh, explain what is the relation between those sample functions and the grid. Uh, so the, the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna normalize those functions. So in other words, we, we have the function and we normalize by, by its integral. Why? Because these normalized functions now uh, go between zero and one. Okay, first they're always positive. So these functions, you see that uh, this is always positive. So it has to be positive. And because it's positive, uh, therefore, when you divide by the integral, we're going to have a function which is going to go between zero and one. Okay. Um, no, when we integrate this thing, actually, when we integrate this thing, then it's going to go between zero and one. So it maps zero to one to zero to one. Um, then the, the next, uh, we need to construct the redefined grid using new sample information. And just like in 1D case, we're going to do the following. So integral of f of g dg is, of course, f of g of x dg over dx dx. Okay, so now I'm just changing the variable in one dimensional case. And therefore, we are going to do the following. We are going to say that f of g of x dg over dx has to be constant. Now, this is exactly uh the same prescription as uh what we discussed last time when when we said that this uh, weight weight function is going to be roughly proportional to w so basically w is going to be more or less this uh weight function f as i said before why well because uh because the weight function itself is dx or dg just like we, uh, we discussed before so the weight function is dx or dg so i can rewrite this thing uh, as fw divided by dx over dg, isn't it? Which means that f twiddle divided by w is constant. So we are we are basically setting w or weight function to be proportional to our previously sampled uh, approximation for f twiddle. But uh, another way to say this is that this means that each interval of the grid contributes the same amount to the integral. Why? Because uh, basically, uh, we we need to make sure that, that the integral of f times g dg is uh, uh, is equal to so for uh, when we integrate this in each uh, little um, uh, interval needs to contain exactly the same amount. Uh, uh, needs to contribute exactly the same to the to the integral. The, uh, only in this case, f twiddle times g or dx is constant. So in other words, if f twiddle of g of x dg of dx is constant, it means that each small interval has to contribute exactly the same to the integral. Isn't that? That's kind of obvious. So this is exactly equivalent to saying that f twiddle times g, uh, f twiddle of g times dg has to uh, has to uh, contribute exactly the same to the integral for each small um, small interval. Okay, so uh, the idea is the following. So we um, first integrate uh, the, the, these functions f twiddle over the old grid, the grid that we, we had before in previous step. And uh, the integral is going to be some number i. This i is just an arbitrary number it, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are going to get. So then we are going to divide this number 
by the number of grid points that we have. I don't know, maybe 100 points, maybe 200 points that we're going to have. So number of grid points, we divide this by number of grid points, and then we require that each grid point, each grid point has exactly the same weight. Uh, and th th this is going to be um, constrained with which we are going to construct new grids. So G mu, GL L minus one mu to GL mu is the new interval. And each new interval has to contain exactly the same, the same weight. Okay. So in other words, this uh, is numeric equivalent of this condition that f of g of x dg of x is constant, which is equivalent to saying that, uh, that the weight function is actually proportional to the average value of the function. OK? Yeah, ng is the number of grid points. Hence, we require that there is exactly the same weight between each two consecutive points between G0, G1, between G1, G2, and so on. So once we have the new grid, we can restart the sampling of the integral of f, just like an equation 23 to 26, using G new. So we generate again a few thousand random set of points and obtain um, new f twiddle functions. And then we repeat this procedure approximately 10 times and we can slightly increase the number of random points each time as the grid function becomes more and more precise at the end we can run a single long run with 10 times longer sampling to reduce sampling error okay so basically this is the this is the this is the um, core of the algorithm now the rest that i'm going to discuss is going to be just small little tricks on top of the uh, the basic algorithm so is this algorithm clear? Any question? Did I lose you? Do you sleep? It is clear. Clear? OK. OK, so in practice, there are a few other tricks that we need to do. Uh, so uh, one problem is that the function, uh, because we have only small uh, or limited number of samples uh, of uh, random points these functions tend to um, oscillate or not oscillate but basically they can they have very complicated spikes okay and we need to get rid of those spikes um, uh, or discontinuities uh, so therefore the idea is that we average over nearest neighbors so instead of using uh, using directly the sample function fi twiddles, we are going to average over, let's say, three neighbors, uh, so that the resulting function is going to be a bit, bit, bit more smooth. Okay, so why well, is this a good idea? Because if the function is has has a spike at one point, because there might be a divergence building up, uh, and, and some other near uh, near nearby points might have then absolutely no point in it. So it's not a good idea to have a weight function, which is exactly zero in some region, and then large at one point. This will generate an instability, okay? So in other words, the, the weight function itself should never uh, uh, fall exactly to zero anyway, because whenever you make the weight function to go to exactly zero at one point, it's like completely removing this uh, part of the volume for sampling. So you're kind of, you make it, completely inaccessible by sampling. And that's bad usually, because imagine that this uh, zero uh, is um, is an error. It occurs because of an error, because you we didn't sample for long enough, OK? So let's say that we kind of construct a, a zero for the weight function in some region where the function itself is not really zero, but it's just because we didn't sample for long enough time. So that's a huge problem, because then this particular part of the volume will never be reached anymore with with uh, random sampling so we're excluding this part of the of the volume in the next iteration so we we, sh we don't want to do that we kind of want to smoothen the function out so that um, that the entire volume uh, which has finite uh, probability or, or the function is not exactly zero uh, are reached with uh, with our random walk so therefore uh, there are several tricks that we're going to use to make function less sharp. So first is the averaging over uh, nearby points. 
And the second one is transforming it in such a way that the that um, uh, yeah that the places where the function uh, appears very large, they're going to be less large, and the places where where uh, function because uh, appears small is going to be less small. So in other words, damping. This is kind of damping uh, that this um, uh, that we are kind of slowly approaching the function f not um, um, how can I say uh, too quickly because if we try to approach this function very very quickly we're gonna we, we can create an instabilities uh, as I said the, the biggest problem is that let's say that the function in some region is small but because we have finite number of points of finite statistics we're gonna uh, kind of approximate the small function with zero but zero is very bad because it means that we kind of exclude this part of the uh face space or volume from uh future sampling and we don't want to do that because it, it it turns out that when we throw more points in we're going to eventually realize that the function is not exactly zero but just very small so therefore it's a good idea to kind of transform the function of the these grids a little bit and the transformation is going to be some it looks like complicated nonlinear function but um, this function is 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 not uh, how can I say it's not uh, uh, so uh, strange. Um, it at small uh, r it uh, raises very very quickly, and then at large r it basically goes linear like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is between zero and one. So I think it reaches three quarters of r. So it, it doesn't reach quite one. I think it's a function like that. Uh, so, in other words, when when the value of the function is very very small, we kind of want to make it large, slightly bigger. But when the value of the function is large, of the order of one, we want to make it slightly smaller. So, just like I said before, and uh, the alternative to this function t of r is actually uh, t of r is square root of r. So the square root has exactly the same property. Uh, tries to make uh, small well, it makes small values large and large values somewhat small. So square root of r is, is going to work equally well. And I tested it, it's actually the same. Um, so yeah, so all those uh, little things are uh, kind of trying to make um, the, the self-consistent uh, uh, self -consistent procedure smoother or uh, use some damp damping. Uh, so that a uh, relatively small number of uh, uh, of steps uh, are going to be sufficient to establish how the uh, function looks like. Okay, so now we are going to go uh, even more into the uh, details of the implementation. Um, so uh, now in, in this particular implementation that I'm going to show you, um, actually this is I think it's copied from numerical recipes. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have um, points distributed between between zero and one, but in such a way that the that uh, x zero is actually not at zero, but x zero is at one over n, and x one is at two over n, and so on. So x n minus two is at n minus one divided by n but x n minus one is at one so why this choice it's kind of unusual uh, normally i would say that x zero should be at zero and x one should be at one over n is that that's what can be more uh, conventional choice um, if, i mean it's not so important but the, uh, one reason is that uh, if we kind want to calculate where uh, in which grid point uh, particular um, value is, uh, if you use this mesh, then the algorithm is very simple. So if we have point X and we are asking in which grid point point X uh, is located, then all we need to do is multiply it with N and take the integer value of it and we're going to get the grid point I. Okay, so otherwise we need, we need to take A minus one. It's not a big difference, but still, uh, this is this this was a choice in in one of the invitations and I copy it. 
So uh, point x uh, uh, x is equal to zero is uh, is uh, we know that the that all these functions at zero are zero. So therefore, we don't keep track of this uh, x of zero is zero. Um, yeah, but we need to be careful when interpolating at point x zero. So for such a equidistant mesh, it is clear that uh, given a point x between zero and one, we can compute. Uh, yeah, so if you have point x, we can compute its grid point uh, simply taking the integer value of x times n. And then we know that x appears between xi minus one and xi, and linear interpolation gives. So this is now the, the expression for the linear interpolation on such a grid. So g of x is gi minus one, gi minus j minus one times this expression. Why? Because uh, as we said, the grid points go like this, I, one over n, i over n divided by one over n. Okay, so the only exception in this case is i is equal to zero. In i is equal to zero, we need we uh, we uh, g i minus one is actually zero. So we can drop this point, and then we get just uh, we get this simple expression. Okay, we want to discuss finally. We want to discuss the calculation of the error and confidence in the result. We will perform m outside iterations, which update the grid. So there are going to be m. Um, Self consistent uh, steps, okay, where m is going to be something between 10 and 20, maybe. Um, each iteration, um, each such iteration will consist of small ni function evaluations of the order of a few thousand, of 10,000. So uh, there are going to be several thousand function evaluations in each step, and then there are going to be several steps, okay, so that uh, um, maybe within a million of uh, function evaluations, we're going to get, get much more precise uh, value of the integrand than if we just uh, threw, uh, if you throw points uh, uh, randomly into the same volume. So from all these calculations, which are going to be m times n, we want to evaluate the best estimate of the integral as, and the estimation of the error bar. So how do we do that? OK, so here is the algorithm. Um, so we are gonna. So now, now we're discussing one iteration. So we're, we, I, I said before that we're gonna have m iterations, iterations, but each, uh, each iteration, in each iteration we do this. We do what? Um, we um, sample. We set small n i points. Okay, and we do we do the following. We uh, uh, evaluate the value of the function on this grid times the derivatives and uh, and of course divide by the number of, of points that we have which is basically just the average value of the function so this average value of the function is what we are looking for this is the integral isn't that that's 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 the integral that we want to have but this is uh, just um, let's say estimation of the integral within this iteration and we're going to have several iterations so of course, at the first iteration, this is the best possible uh, value of the integral we have. But in the next iteration, we might have we we are going to improve the um, the approximation uh, for the integral. So at the same time, we're going to sample also the f square. Now you can imagine that the this f square uh, has to do with uh, estimating the error bars because we need to we need to estimate how big is the error. So uh, yeah, f square is a simple thing. So then the estimation of the variance is of course uh, f square average minus average f square divided by well n i minus one. So if we are precise, it's actually n i minus one. Sometimes when we are sloppy, we just remove this one and we divide by n i. Um, but n i is big anyway, so several thousands. So therefore, uh, it doesn't matter so much whether we divide by n minus one by, or, or not. Anyway, so this is uh, the variance of the uh, of the function uh, in this particular iteration. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the the variance of the Monte Carlo sampling, of course, is one over n i square square root of n i square. So yeah, so basically this value goes as one over square root of n i, as expected from Monte Carlo. And then from all accumulated evaluations of the function, after m iterations, we can construct the best estimate of the integral. So naively, we will just calculate 
um, average over all m iterations. So we said that we're going to be there are going to be m iterations. At each iteration, we're going to evaluate the average of f. Okay, so each iteration we can evaluate average of f, and then when we have all those, naively we would say, well, all we need to do is to then to average over those averages. Isn't that? So we calculate average of f in each iteration, and we take the average of this, and this is our best estimation for the integral. Now, unfortunately, well, luckily, we can uh, get better estimation than that. Why? Well, because we know something about the error in each iteration. So the first iteration is going to be least precise. Next iteration is going to be slightly more precise, and then even more precise, and so on and so forth. So we need to use the, the information that successive iterations tend to get more precise. Okay, And that will give us better approximation. Yeah. So at the first few iterations, the error was very bigger than at the last iteration. And therefore, we want to penalize those early estimates. Okay, penalize all estimates which are which were not so good. So how do we achieve that? Well, uh, this is the prescription. So we we said that we are going to calculate the this um, uh, this error. So we are calculating sigma square. Okay, the, of the variance we are calculating the variance, and if we have the variance in each iteration uh, and uh, when the variance is very very large uh, we are going to penalize the estimations of the function when the variance is very large because we want to kind of remove the early iterations or we want to kind of uh, make uh, early estimations less important because we know that they have large variance so and every time we get a large variance we kind of penalize this estimate for the for the integral, and of course, uh, in order to, to do this properly, we also need to divide by this uh, sigma I square at the end of the day. So, in other words, this um, this this um, uh, best estimation of the integral is constructed in such a way that uh, it always converges uh, to um, this to the same value of the integral, but uh, properly reweighting. Uh, properly reweighting um, the different approximations uh, to the for the same quantity uh, according to the statistical um, statistical precision. Okay, so similarly, the error does not just sum up. So in this case, uh, the error doesn't sum up. So if we if we use naive uh, naive estimation. Uh, where f r f w i sum over i one over m. If we use this, then the error would be would be just uh, uh, basically sum over uh, sigma i square. I think that the error would be just that sigma square would be the sum over sigma i square. Okay, so that that would be bad if this is the average. If this is i best, is that? So if this is i best, we're going to have a, a, a sigma square will also sum up. But that's not what we want to do. We want to do it. We, we did it much better. So we calcul calculated um, integral in this, in this way. And therefore, the uh, sigma square is also uh, uh, much smaller. So yeah, this is the proper weight. Um, OK, and finally, we can also estimate the chi square, or basically the, uh, uh, the uh, the chi square for this integral, which uh, tells you how reliable the integral is, by uh, calculating um, uh, basically deviation again. So this is again someone some kind of standard deviation. So uh, this is the value of the function in each iteration uh, minus the best estimate of the value of the function. So again, it's like uh, the fluctuations of the uh, of the uh, integral in each iteration divided by its corresponding uh, 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 error, uh, and then uh, divided by m minus one because uh, the error of the Monte Carlo goes goes as one over m. Okay. So uh, this is the entire implementation. So now we know everything.
this is what we need to implement. So the crucial point is to sample not just the value of the function, uh, but also the square of the function. And we also need to uh, sample those projections. Okay, So projection to each dimension. And once we have projection to each dimension, we need to um, we need to invert this function. So basically, this this entire complicated um, uh, expressions for uh, constructing new grids is basically equivalent to finding the inverse of the w. You remember we said that we need to some we need something like v i inverse of the, of the weight function, isn't that? So this inverting the weight function itself is equivalent to finding the new grid points uh, numerically uh, from this from this from this, from this expression okay so uh, this Vegas algorithm is efficiently implemented in new scientific library so I think uh, some of you probably installed new scientific library and uh, if you did you can uh, directly use, uh, its um, implementation. Uh, I uh, provided on my web page uh, a wrapper for um, this uh, GNU scientific library, which is not too difficult to use in C++ if you want to do that. Um, and But um, here in the class, we're going to discuss uh, its uh, Python implementation. So uh, Jupyter Notebook, actually. Uh, and uh, for the testing, we're going to uh, integrate this function, uh, which uh, is uh, sim which has simple uh, poles um, in a few places. So when kx, so how this work? When kx, ky, and kz are all zero, we have a pole. When uh, or yeah, when kx is zero or pi, ky is zero and pi, or kz is zero and pi, uh, then um no uh, yeah then we have a pole so basically if we plot this so we have uh, the pole when when all of them are zero when uh, one of them is pi and the rest are zero so then we have this poles is that so the poles are now uh, not along the diagonal but they're only in points or the way you can think of it is that they are in, along the axis so since the 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 uh, divergences are along the axis, the Vegas algorithm is supposed to be very efficient. Okay. Um, if we had the, the, the divergence along the diagonal, then Vegas would not improve much uh, on the naive Monte Carlo. Um, yeah, so now here is the check that I've done with uh, GNU uh, scientific library. Uh, so uh, plain um, algorithm means uh, uh, plain Monte Carlo. So we just throw uh, a million of points uh, into the uh, volume V. So in this case, from zero to pi, zero to pi, zero to pi, I think this is three dimensional. Yeah, so three dimensional. So we have a cube so from zero to pi, zero to pi, zero to pi. We throw uh, probably a million points in there. And this is the result that we get. Uh, it's a sigma square, exact value. The error is 10 to the minus 2. So not so bad. Uh, even if we just uh, throw uh, points uh, naively into the volume. Uh, but if we use this MISER algorithm, that's the algorithm that uh, uses the stratified sampling. Since three-dimensional integrals, integrals are, are uh, small, uh, uh, this uh, MISER, of course, is very efficient. Uh, and uh, when we use the MISR, it turns out that the sigma is reduced for one order of magnitude. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, the, the value is much more, 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 much more precise. And then finally, when we use the Vegas algorithm, uh, we first use, uh, uh, I think, 10% of the points to warm up, basically to get, uh, uh, to get estimation for a good, good grid. As we, dis as we discussed right now. And then we use this uh, uh, good grid in such a way that we uh, uh, sample uh, functions with important sampling. And then the result, of course, is much better. The error bar is 10 to the minus 5. 
So this is a, it's a huge improvement, 10 to the minus two, and this would be 10 to the minus four. So we have two orders of magnitude better uh, estimation for the integral of this method, two orders of magnitude with the same number of function evaluations. So uh, yeah, so important sampling is, is very, very useful, of course. Okay, so um, yeah, this is it. Um, we, we kind of understood now the entire algorithm. Um, and uh, now it's time for the implementation, I guess. Where should we start here? Yeah. So now it's a good idea to open uh, your, um, uh, the uh, Jupyter notebook um, in which you have uh, Vegas implemented. And you can, you can try to repeat after me uh, this evaluations. Now, um, in previous years, we were co we coded together uh, in class uh, Vegas algorithm. So I would type and students would type. Now, of course, uh, this remote Zoom uh, lectures are different. So I, I can't do that because I cannot uh, look at your screens to see how you're coding. And therefore, I just gave you the, the implementation. And I'm going to try to walk you through uh, each step so that you understand every little detail of the implementation. And then I need to ask you for the homework uh, to change something. And I don't know yet what. OK, eventually, I hope that I find some a good, uh, some good uh, idea of how you're going to tweak the algorithm a little bit. Uh, is there any question? Any question? Nobody? Do you have the Jupyter notebooks? Did you find them? Yes. Yes, you do? OK. So uh, two ways to do it. One is to just get it from our web page, Jupyter notebooks. The other one is, of course, on GitHub, where everything is already located. I hope that the versions are the same. I think so. Um, Okay, so the, the the very first thing that we're going to do today is the naive Monte Carlo. Uh, now, of course, naive Monte this implementation that we have here is slightly too more complicated for naive Monte Carlo. But the reason for this is because we kind of want to uh, uh, use the same con constructs that we're going to use in Vegas, but use them for naive Monte Carlo. Okay, naive Monte Carlo is going to be like a first stepping stone towards the Vegas algorithm, okay? So therefore, the name Monte Carlo looks slightly complicated in this uh, implementation. implementation. So um, we're gonna define a class which is called uh, cumulans. And basically the, the, its sole purpose is to um, uh, keep track of various variables that we need, statistical, uh, statistical constructs. Um, so, um, the first one is called self sum, which is very simple. It's just um, uh, sum over all uh, sum over all function uh, function values. Uh, just a second. So where would this uh, where this was? Uh, so just a second. Function sum over all f's. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess we need this for the for the average. Yeah. So. Um, Self sum is just sum of all uh, of the value of the function f0, f1, fn. So then we also need squares of the value of the function f0 square, f1 square, f2 square, and so on. This is in self sq sum. Uh, yeah, so what I wanted to say is that uh, the eventually in Vegas algorithm, uh, the value of the function is going to be. Uh, is going to be, of course, proportional to. So this is going to be the, the this part is going to be stored in uh, in self sum. Yeah. So in self sum, we're going to store we're going to store uh, we're going to store this thing, and then self sq sum is going to be this quantity, isn't that the squares of the function? Okay, the squares of the function. Kind of obvious. Um, then uh, self average is going to be our i best. So you remember we said before that our i best is 
uh, is this quantity. Uh, this quantity, isn't it? So if we have the average of function uh, and sigma square of this thing, we can calculate I best, of course. So self average is going to be our I best. Then self error is going to be uh, error for the best, for I best. Again, the expression uh, that we derived here was, was this, one over sigma best. It's the error of sigma best. Then chi square. Uh, so this quantity chi square is, is of course this quantity here. Uh, and then what else? Self weight sum is um, uh, one over sigma i squares. So this is of course uh, similar to, uh, to this self error. Okay, um, then self error sum is f of i divided by sigma i square. So it's the running average of this one of, uh, of those quantities that we need. So for example, we need this quantity, isn't it? f divided by sigma square. Uh, and we need f squared divided by sigma square. So this f squared divided by sigma square is something that we're gonna use uh, for the projection. So what is the projection? So projection, I think, yeah. So uh, yeah, projection is f square. So I don't know why it's sigma square. Okay, so th there are going to be various quantities that we're going to need in in uh, in Vegas algorithm, and we're going to keep track of them. Uh, now, uh, of course, in in naive Monte Carlo, we're going to use only subset of those because we don't need all of them. So now what do we do in naive Monte Carlo? Uh, the first argument here is the function. So we're it's we are gonna we are giving here like a pointer to a function, isn't that or basically the the name of the function on which we're gonna uh, or which we're gonna evaluate uh, the uh, the value of the function. Then n dim is the number of the dimensions of this function. So uh, in our case, we, we're using three-dimensional uh, function, but of course, n dim can be generally general. Uh, general can be uh, any. We can have any dimension uh, uh, of the of the function. So, yeah, unit is um, uh, is the transformation from uh, zero from the hypercube from zero to one to some other value. So in case of um, integration between zero and pi, unit is pi. So unit is basically the length of the interval, okay? The length of the interval for the integration. So again, in our particular example, where unit is gonna be pi, which means that we are uh, extending the interval from zero to pi, uh, from zero to one to zero to pi. So it's the way we scale the uh, unit cube. Max eval is the maximum number of uh, evaluations of those uh, function evaluations. So this is gonna be the input to our uh, Monte Carlo. So let's say million evaluations that we, are, we can afford. And then uh, we are gonna give this class cumulants. Uh, so cum is basically, uh, uh, it needs to, needs to be, uh, needs to contain, um, uh, needs to contain the uh, class cumulants in which we are gonna uh, uh, we are gonna change. Um, yeah, so uh, here this n batch is gonna be set to thousand. So what does n batch mean? It means uh, in Python the evaluation of functions is uh, if if we have a do loop uh, for loop in Python the function evaluation is going to be extremely small, slow. So what's, of course, much more efficient is to evaluate function on many, many points at the same time, simultaneously. And so n batch is going to be the number of function evaluations that we do at once, okay? And of course, then we were going to do, uh, we're going to evaluate function on many, many batches, but batch is the smallest number of uh, function evaluations that we do at once. Okay, so uh, of course we could play with this end batch a little bit, whether it's a good idea to do only 100 at some point or 1000 or maybe 10,000, I don't know, that depends, but uh, 
it's definitely better to uh, evaluate several hundreds of uh, function evaluations at once rather than just one at a po at, at each time so uh, this is going to be way more efficient uh, so uh, this m eval will count the number of total function evaluations so eventually n val uh, n number of uh, n eval which is number of function evaluations has to become equal to max eval of course eventually but uh, at the beginning we're going to set it to zero and then we are going to write a do loop over um, kind of number of function evaluations but in uh, batches so you see this? sorry what yep. is max eval Max eval is the input number, maximum number of function evaluations that the user wants. So let's say you you want to have your integral of the function using one million function evaluations. Then max mm -hmm. eval is one million. Okay, maximum number uh -huh. of function evaluations you can afford. Let's say. I see. Okay, so the input. Um, yeah, I mean here we we almost never uh, well in quadratures. You usually uh, give us an input the error of the the error that you want to have, isn't that? So you usually give an, as an input. Let's say precision has to be ten to the minus three, isn't it? But in Monte Carlo you can't do that. You can't ask. Well, in principle you could, but usually we don't ask for the error. We we um, ask for the maximum number of evaluations. And then Monte Carlo gives you the uh, corresponding error at this number of evaluations, isn't it? Um, yeah, so uh, now this loop here is basically uh, um, sampling, no, is, is iterating through uh, uh, function evaluations, but it um, changes for n batch because at each uh, time that we, uh, you see, evaluate the function, we are going to make it uh, around n batch function evaluations, isn't that n batch? So every time we, we do this, integrant of xr, integrant is our function, isn't that? Integrant is, is our function, integrant. So we evaluate integrant on these points xr, but xr contains already n batch number of points, isn't that? many okay so therefore this uh, do loop here goes in steps of n batch so it starts with maximum number of evaluations that we need and then eventually it will stop when the uh, this uh, n samples become zero um, and every time we reduce this is a reduction every time we reduce n samples for n batch because we kind of uh, uh, we evaluated n batch uh, evaluations already. So now this n is uh, most of the time n is going to be just n batch, but when we make the last step, then n is smaller than n batch. Why? Because, well, we want to be kind of precise here. We don't want to uh, calculate only approximately this maximum this uh, number of evaluations but exactly this number of evaluations that the user asked us doesn't it if the user asked us for uh, one million in three steps and we are making every time a thousand steps then we know that the last step is going to have only three function evaluations and kind of we want to we want to do uh, uh, this precisely so of course if the if n batch is commensurate with uh, the number of maximum number of function evaluations, then this n is always going to be n batch uh, uh, and never less than n batch, isn't it? Um, okay, so this is the actual number of function evaluations in this pass. So uh, this xr here is uh, is actually is the random numbers. So these are the random numbers which are uniformly distributed in our hypercube. Now, uh, random random gives you uniform distributed points. Uh, uh, it basically gives you a, a two dimensional array of uniform distributed points uh, in uh, hyper hypercube with a with a dimension uh, no with the with the size unit. So therefore, the points are not distributed from zero to one. 
but the points are distributed from zero to unit, zero to unit, zero to unit, doesn't it? We could generalize this to A to B, doesn't it, if you wanted to, but right now we are just distributing these random points rather than between zero and one, we distribute them between zero and unit, or in this case would be pi. And then here this N is the number of points in a batch and N dim is the number of dimensions. So therefore, we the points are now uh, a two-dimensional array of batch times dimension uh, of the function. Okay, and so once we have those these points uh, of in the two D array, we give them to the integrand, and this gives us the value of the function on the entire batch. Okay. And uh, that's all we need. So once we have the value of the function in our batch, we just uh, calculate the average of the function and the uh, average of the square, and that's all. That's that's all we need. And uh, Monte Carlo is is uh, is is finished. Uh, now it, time is six twenty. Therefore, I want to break here. Uh, is there any question that you want to ask? Urgent question. So I have a question uh, about the uh, homework, not about this stuff, so I can wait. Okay. Yeah, we can discuss later. Any other, any other thing? Any question? Um, where is integrand defined, Professor? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so in, in this step, the integrand is arbitrary, just a function. But then here we are going to define uh, my integrand. I mean, one possi possible implementation, isn't it? And it's, it looks like this. So uh, this is the function that we are testing, isn't it? One divided by one minus cosine x times y times z, isn't it? Divided by pi to the three. Okay. So this is the integral. And you see here that we are, we are evaluating, we're using this uh, uh, nice thing of NumPy that you can evaluate um, a function on, uh, lots of points at the same time, isn't that? So we are evaluating this on uh, the entire batch of points at once. So if the function is more complicated and it's not easy to um, vectorize it, we would need to use this uh, uh, NumPy uh, uh, capability of vectorizing the function. You remember we uh, discussed this, vectorize. Now, in this implementation, I'm not using Numba. And uh, it's actually a good point how much you can improve this by using Numba. Uh, and that's something that uh, you can try. Uh, at the time when I was coding this, I didn't uh, yet, uh, uh, um, I didn't yet uh, uh, do much research with Numba and therefore I, I, didn't, I, didn't, input, I didn't input here Numba capability. Any other question? If not, then, um, well, see you on Wednesday. And if you have questions, then you can ask after uh, I stopped, uh, we stopped, uh, yeah, uh, recording. <laughs>